Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. It is now 18.30 South African time, and thank you for joining us for lecture number three, uh, level two CSA and Western Province Cricket Umpiring course. Tonight we will start off by covering last week's uh, or Monday's revision questions. I will then do Law 20. Uh, Tom will do Law 21 and 22, as well as uh, tonight's revision questions. And then we will open up the floor for some Q&A. So if I can quickly go through Monday night's revision questions. In terms of the toss and with specific reference to the timings, who needs to be there, where the toss takes place, and what is handed over at the toss. So the captain needs to be present um, at the toss. Either one or both umpires needs to be at the toss. It can take place anywhere on, on the field, although <coughs> Custom, um, custom, it's customary to toss next to the mass pits. The window period for the toss to take place is, if the game starts at 10 o'clock, is from 9.30 until 9.45. It's important that each, each captain nominate his or her players in writing to one of the umpires, either before the toss or at the toss. Uh, it's important that you will not toss until you get the nomination seat from both captains. And lastly, the captain winning the toss needs to notify the opposing captain and the umpires immediately whether he or she will bat or field. And once notified, that decision cannot be changed. Next question. Name three instances when a run can be scored. Firstly, as often as the batters at any time while the ball is in play, they have crossed and made good the ground from end to end. Runs can also be scored when either a boundary four or a boundary six is scored. And lastly, runs can be scored when penalty runs are awarded. Third revision question of Monday evening. Name four ways when the side's innings is considered to be done. Firstly, when the side is all out, that is when the side's innings is considered to be completed. At the, at the fall of a wicket or the retirement of a batter, there are further balls remain to be bowled, but no further batter is available to come in. The innings is also completed when the captain declares. Also completed when the captain forfeits the innings. And lastly, the innings is also completed when there were, was an agreement uh, to have a certain amount of overs bowled uh, per innings or if there was a prescribed time per innings. And the last of Monday evening's revision questions, the umpire at the bowler's end allows a seventh ball to be bowled, and that seventh delivery is a no ball. So what do you do? So the umpire will, as soon as he realizes that six valid balls has been bowled, he or she may call over. Even though the seventh ball was a no ball, the umpire should call over. 
So the first law that I'll be covering this evening is the dead ball law. So when is the ball dead? There are two ways that the ball becomes dead. The ball either becomes automatically dead uh, or the umpire needs to call and signal a dead ball. Firstly, we are going to cover when the ball automatically becomes dead. So there's, an, there's going to be an incident that take, takes place and that incident causes the ball to become dead. So the second that the ball becomes dead, anything that happens afterwards is irrelevant. So firstly, the ball becomes automatically dead when it finally settles in the hands of the wicketkeeper or of the bowler. So when we when the law speaks about finally settles in the hands of the wicketkeeper or the bowler, that is a judgment call for the umpires uh, to make. They decide when the ball is finally settled uh, or not. E examples of this, the bowler uh, bowls, delivers the ball, um, batter sold his arms, and it goes through to the uh, wicketkeeper. Now it is in the hands of the wicketkeeper. So now it's important for the umpires, they then decide when that ball is finally settled or not. It is a judgment call. Uh, if I can use an example, uh, one of the things I judge is, we, uh, um, in my example, Pat Polar delivers, Pat the soldier's arms, goes to the keeper. The keeper then tosses the ball to first slip. So the moment he tosses the ball to first slip and first slip catches it, I consider that ball to be uh, dead. You'll find it, especially in, in lower league cricket, you'll see the 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 um, ball goes through the keeper, he tosses the ball to first slip. First slip then sees the the batter leaving his crease to do a bit of gardening. First slip will then have aside the stumps. If first slip uh, dislodges the bales, I will immediately call and signal dead ball because according to me, that ball has finally settled in the hands of the keeper and that's why the keeper tossed it to first love. Again, it is a judgment call and the umpires decide when that ball is finally settled. The ball also becomes automatically dead as soon as a boundary is scored. So as soon as the ball hits the boundary rope with a, a a boundary four or a boundary six, that ball then immediately becomes dead. The ball also immediately becomes dead or, or, or automatically becomes dead as soon as the batter is dismissed. So what, whatever mode of dismissal, as soon as that dismissal occurs, that ball immediately becomes dead. And nothing that happens after uh, the dismissal is relevant. I'll use an example. The bowler delivers the ball, the batsman plays forward, misses it, and it the bales get dislodged. And then, after dislodging the ball, dislodging the bales, it then ricochets past the keeper towards the boundary, and it actually goes over the, over the boundary. According to the law, so that ball, as soon as the batter was dismissed, or as soon as that, the, those bells were dislodged, the ball automatically becomes dead, and nothing that happens afterwards is relevant. So, point I'm trying to make is, yes, the ball did go over the boundary after hitting the bells, it went past the keeper over the boundary. That boundary four will not be given or will not stand. And the reason is, as soon as those, the ball dislodged the bales, the batter was bowled, i.e. the batter was dismissed, i.e. the ball is automatically dead. The ball also becomes automatically dead, whether it's played or not, that ball becomes trapped between the bat and person 
of the batter or between items of his or her clothing or equipment. An example of this, the spinner bowls, uh, the batsman plays forward, the, the ball then gets trapped between his bat and the, the pad. So if you can just visualize batter playing forward, ball becomes trapped between bat and uh, the pad. According to the law, the moment that ball be became trapped between the bat and the person of the batter, it automatically becomes dead. The ball also automatically becomes dead when it lodges in the clothing or equipment of a batter or the clothing of an umpire. An example of this is um, you can visualize the ball uh, gets uh, a spinner balls, the batter plays forward, uh, it then loops up and gets lodged in the flap or the top of the pad of the batter. The, the moment that ball lodges in the top of the, the, the flap or the top of the pad of the batter, that ball automatically becomes dead. The ball also automatically becomes dead if there is an award of penalty runs under either law 24.4 when a player returned without a permission we covered this in in law uh, in the level one course we will also next week monday uh, cover law 24. also the ball automatically becomes dead as soon as there is illegal fielding and that ball shall not count as one for the over The ball also becomes automatically dead as soon as it hits the protective helmets belonging to the fielding side that was placed behind the wicketkeeper. So as soon as the ball, while in play, hits the, the protective helmet of the fielding side that was placed behind the keeper, that ball automatically becomes dead. On Monday evening, we spoke about the match being concluded. As soon as the match is concluded, as soon as that winning run um, was scored, the ball automatically becomes dead. So I've covered now the eight ways where the ball automatically becomes dead. Because lots of players, they don't know the law, it is good umpiring technique to still call and signal dead ball, even though the law tells us that the ball is automatically dead when any of these eight instances happen, uh, but good umpiring techniques just to call and signal uh, dead ball, just to inform the players, because there's lots of players that do not know the laws. The ball is also dead when it is clear to the bowling bowlers in umpire that both the fielding side and the batters at the wicket has ceased to regard the ball as still in play. So it's judgment call of the bowlers in umpire in his, opi in his or her opinion that the fielding side and both batters uh, at the wicket as sees to regard the ball as still in play. Earlier I said, well, with regards to the ball being finally settled, who decides on it? The umpires decide whether the ball is finally settled in the hands of the keeper or the bowler. It is very, very important that before you, uh, the bowlers in umpire call over or before the bowlers in umpire calls time, the umpire needs to make sure that before he does it, the ball needs to be dead. So it's important, do not call over or time until 
you sure that the ball is dead or delay that call, make 100% sure that the ball is dead and once the ball is dead, then call over or time. Earlier, I, I spoke about uh, uh, the ball automatically become, becoming dead and we handled eight instances. Here, the loss is reiterating that it's, uh, it is the prerogative of the umpire and I, I feel it's good umpiring technique to call and signal dead ball. Even though the ball automatically became dead, just to indicate or to everyone so that the players are informed, lots of them don't know the laws, call, call and signal loudly dead ball so everyone is well aware what is going on. So now we're going to cover when it's important that the umpire, that either umpire call and signal dead ball. So there's going to be instances now that happens on the field of play that it's important that either umpire call and signal dead ball. So what are those incidents? Firstly, when there's a serious injury to any player or umpire, either umpire can call and signal dead ball. It needs to be a serious injury, and again, that is your judgment call. The, um, either umpire needs to make the, that uh, judgment call. Uh, if it's just uh, graze the fingertips of, of the bowler, I wouldn't consider that as a serious injury. So um, I would not intervene by calling and signaling dead ball. Uh, for me, an example of a serious injury is, uh, let's say the batter gets bowled against the head or any fielder bowler gets hit against uh, the head uh, by, by the ball. I would consider that a serious injury. And it's then important for either umpire to immediately call and signal dead ball if he or she feels that there's a serious injury to a player or umpire. So as soon as the umpire call and signal dead ball, anything that happens after that call is irrelevant. So you will sometimes find in a added where the batter was bowled against, um, against the head and the batter uh, uh, went uh, down, he went down on his knees, but outside his crease, I felt that was a serious injury to the batter. It's then important to immediately intervene because the ball then ricocheted towards the gully area. Gully was then trying to run out the, the, the striker. But if you intervene quickly, because I saw that as a serious injury to the, the, the batter, he got bowled against uh, the head and he stumbled uh, um, to his knees outside his crease to prevent anything else from happening. I call that signal dead ball it, uh, because anything that happens after that is relevant. So you then nullify the, the run out that maybe the fielding side um, can try. But again, important thing is it needs to be a serious injury. Either umpire to call and signal dead ball if he or she needs to in intervene in case of unfair play. The moment the umpire, either umpire sees any form of unfair play on the field, call and signal dead ball and then uh, intervene. If the umpire leaves his or her normal position for consultation, call and signal dead ball. So this usually happens, uh, and I'll use an, uh, uh, an example. The, the bowler delivers the ball, the batter hits the ball towards uh, first slip. First slip then takes it low um, to the ground or just above uh, the ground. Uh, the bowler's in umpire's view was blocked because the bowler was in his way. So the bowler's in umpire was not sure whether the ball uh, cleanly carried into first slip's hand. What the bowlers in umpire should then do is call and signal dead ball. And I'm going to give you a bit of practical tip. What you also do is ask the fielding side for the ball. 
once you have collected the ball, you then leave your normal position from behind the bow, from behind the stumps at the bowler's end. You then walk over to your colleague to consult whether the ball clearly came. Either umpire to call and signal dead ball when one or both bales falls from the striker's wicket before the striker had the opportunity playing at the ball. The important part here is that one or both bales needs to fall from the striker's uh, wicket. The, um, the strikers in umpire he or she is in the best position to, to call this, but there's nothing stopping the bowlers in umpire if the bowlers in umpire clearly saw the one or both bales uh, falls from the striker's wicket before the striker had the opportunity of playing at the ball. So now we know if, if, the, if the bales fall from the striker's wicket, either umpire needs to call and signal dead ball. So what do we do if the bales fall from the bowler's in uh, wicket? Do we call and signal dead ball? No, we don't. The law only tells us if it falls from the striker's wicket, then we should call and signal uh, dead ball. If it falls from the bowler's in uh, side, let's say as the bowler's running in and he, the bowler delivers the ball and a gust of wind then blows the bales off at the bowler's end. In that case, if, um, if let's say the batter doesn't, sometimes the batter will pull out because the, the bales fell from the, the bowler's uh, inside. If the bowler doesn't stop, if, if play continues, you will allow play to continue. If it is not bothering the batter, if the bales fell off at the bowler's end, if it didn't bother the fielding side and they just continue playing as per normal, you, the umpire, should allow play to continue if it falls from the bowler's end uh, side. But from if it falls from the striker's end side, before the striker had opportunity, either umpire to call and signal dead ball. Another instance where either umpire needs to call and signal dead ball. If the striker is not ready for the delivery of the ball for whatever reason, and if the ball is delivered, the striker makes no attempt to play at the ball. Also, the umpire needs to be satisfied that the striker a genuine reason for not being ready. So the important part of this uh, point number five is, so if the striker is not ready and he has a genuine re reason for not being ready, and if the ball is delivered, the important thing is the striker needs to make no attempt to play at the ball. He needs to leave the ball. If the striker does, try to play, the ball gets delivered and, he, and he, a striker does attempt to play at the ball, that striker actually now brings, brings himself or herself back into play and is then eligible to be uh, dismissed. We do have a video later on where I will discuss this point in a bit more detail. Point number six, in this instance, the striker was now distracted by a noise or a movement or in any other way while the striker was preparing to receive uh, the ball. Just an example of, of this, uh, let's say there's a, a movement behind the side screen. As the bowler is running in, uh, one of the uh, security guards, one of the spectators, um, walks past uh, the side screen. Because of that movement, the striker was distracted. According to the law, uh, if the striker was distracted by a noise or movement, either umpire to
to call and signal dead ball. I also had a case in, in a club game where there was a, 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 we the field was opposite a, a hospital, and while the striker was 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 the um, while the bowler was in his run up, almost about to deliver the ball, there was this huge siren from one of the uh, ambulances. The striker got distracted by the sudden um, loud um, noise, and he, and he took a step towards uh, Squarely. Immediately, I called and signaled dead ball because I saw the striker was distracted by this noise. Um, this, yes, this noise was out, uh, outside. It was about 10, 15 meters uh, outside the boundary, but still it was a loud noise and the striker was distracted. It's not necessarily the noise or movement it has to be inside the field of play. Point number seven, the umpire, either umpire needs to call and signal dead ball if there was a deliberate attempt to distract, deceive, or obstruct the batter. We will go into point number seven in much, much more detail in, in our lecture number six. Either umpire to call and signal dead ball if the bowler drops the ball accidentally before delivery. So as the bowler is running in, the EOC accidentally then drops the ball, either umpire to call and signal dead ball. The ball does not leave the bowler's hand other than if he or she tries to run out the non-striker. If this is the case, either umpire to call and signal a dead ball. So an example of this, the bowler runs up in his delivery stride. He goes through all the motion, arm comes around the shoulder, it goes through his full he, uh, his goes through a uh, uh, full motion, but the bowler does not deliver or release the ball. If that is the case, either umpire to call and signal dead ball. Although it's uh, it's it's the duty of the bowlers in umpire in this instance to call and signal dead ball because the ball did not leave the bowler's hand. And lastly, either umpire to call and signal dead ball when either of the umpires is satisfied that the ball, while still in play, cannot be recovered. An example of this is, and I'll use an actual example, the I, I did a first class game between uh, Namibia and uh, a provincial side in South Africa called uh, Free State. Um, this was about five, six years ago when Namibia's national team still played in the provincial competition um, in South Africa. They do not anymore, but about five years ago, they still played in the provincial competition in uh, South Africa. So. Um, this, was, this game was in Namibia, and on the field, there was, there was um, an animal or animals called uh, Mirkata. So they were actually about 10, 15 meters from the boundary, these Mirkata. They had holes that they dug in the ground, and from time to time, they would, their heads would poke out of these holes and they would look at, the, they, they were like the spectators on the field. So these holes dug by these Mirkata on inside the field of play. So luckily in the game, the ball didn't go down one of these, these um, holes, uh, but this is an example of point number 10. 
if the ball had to go down one of these uh, these holes while the ball will, was still in play, as soon as that ball go down that hole, either umpire to call and signal dead ball because once that ball goes down that hole, that ball was not was unrecoverable. We would not have been able to recover those balls because those the the meerkatter they do have very sharp teeth and none of the fielders was going to put their hands in that hole trying to retrieve the ball, I can guarantee you, because uh, those mere, those mere cut uh, animals, uh, they do have sharp teeth. So that is just an example, an actual example that happened to me, even though the ball didn't go down the hole, but if it had to go down the hole, um, I would have called and signal uh, dead ball as soon as it goes down the hole. The, the important part here is, this needs to be while the ball is, is still in play inside the field of play. This does not refer to a ball getting hit out, out of the ground into the, the river or into the, the bushes outside the ground. That is, this, this doesn't refer to that. If that ball is hit into the river or into the, uh, into the bush, bushes outside the ground, that uh, is obviously a boundary uh, six or could have been a boundary four, uh, but that ball is obviously uh, uh, not able to be recovered. But this point number 10 does not refer to uh, that instance. It refers to something uh, inside the field of play and the ball becomes unrecoverable. When does the ball cease to become dead? The ball becomes alive as soon as the bowler starts his or her run up. The very split second that the bowler gives his or her first step, that ball now becomes alive. Anything before then, the ball is still dead as soon as the bowler gives is our first step, the ball then becomes alive. Some bowlers have no run-up. If the bowler has no run-up, as soon as the bowler then starts his or bowling action, the ball then becomes alive. Now I'm going to play you a, a video. Peterson has backed away. Now that shouldn't be out. It should be a dead ball. Peterson backed away. A chaotic morning at Edgbaston. Salman Butt has got a, a reason to complain here. Peterson can back away and say dead ball, but then he shouldn't hit the ball after that. An incident packed day two for Kevin Peterson. First, another let off after twice being dropped on day one. A nick onto the pad, but horribly dropped by Uma Amin. I cannot believe he's just dropped that. Even if you're going for the LB, you still catch it. Under 12s wouldn't do that. This is test cricket. That's appalling. Peterson then seemingly getting another life. Backing away, but hitting it and getting caught by Salman Butt, only for the ball to be called dead. By the letter of the law, given that Peterson played the ball, he should probably have been given out. But the spirit of the game prevailed, and KP was on his way to a far from flawless, but very welcome half century. So before I hand over uh, uh, to Tom, that's gonna do the noble uh, law next. I wanted to discuss uh, this video in a bit of detail because I spoke to Marie Erasmus. He was the standing umpire or he was the umpire at, at the bowler's end. And I asked him uh, about the incident and he explained to me uh, the incident in uh, detail. So if I, if I can just re, uh, go back to the earlier slide that showed if you look at point number five, so if the strike is not ready for the ball and if the ball is delivered, 
makes no attempt to play at the ball. So the striker, according to the law, needs to make no attempt to play at the ball. So as soon as he plays at the ball, the striker now brings him back into, into uh, play. Also, if you look at point number six, where the law says if the striker is distracted by any noise or movement while preparing to receive the delivery, either umpire to call and signal dead ball. So taking those two points into account, I'm now going to go back to the Kevin Peterson uh, video. And so what I want you to, to, look, to look at is, I want you now to look at Marie Rasmus, especially the, the latter part of the clip where they slow it down. So uh, look at Marie uh, Erasmus and look at what he does just before Kevin Peterson plays at the ball. Um, you, you can see it more clearly, the latter part of the clip when they slow it down. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to replay the clip. And Peterson has backed away. Now that shouldn't be out, it should be a dead ball. Peterson backed away. A chaotic morning at Edgbaston. Salman Butts has got a, a reason to complain here. Peterson can back away and say dead ball, but then he shouldn't hit the ball after that. An incident-packed day two for Kevin Peterson. First, another let-off after twice being dropped on day one. A nick onto the pad, but horribly dropped by Umar Amin. I cannot believe he's just dropped that. Even if you're going for the LB, you still catch it. Under-12s wouldn't do that. This is test cricket. That's appalling. Peterson then seemingly getting another life. Backing away, but hitting it and getting caught by Salman Butt, only for the ball to be called dead. By the letter of the law, given that Peterson played the ball, he should probably have been given out. But the spirit of the game prevailed, and KP was on his way to a far from flawless, but very welcome half-century. So before I hand over it, uh, to Tom, so I spoke to Maria Rasmus about the incident. So Maria Rasmus applied point number six in in uh, when the umpires would call and signal dead ball. Because what happened, there was lots of chatter from, from the slip cordon to Kevin Peterson. So as the bowler was running in, Kevin Peterson was distracted by the noise from the slip cordon. Kevin Peterson then backed away. So Maria Rasmus heard the, the noise or the chatter uh, by the slip cordon as the bowler was running in. And according to him, and you could see because Peterson uh, stepped away, Peterson was distracted by this. So if you look at especially at this last part of the clip just before peterson hit the ball you can actually see uh marie erasmus starting to signal dead ball already so what happened even before uh kp hit the ball marie already called dead ball and he was on the way signaling dead ball so before kp hit it marie called it so what does that mean? As soon as the, the, the umpire calls dead ball, as soon as that word uh, comes over his or her lips, that ball immediately becomes dead and anything that happens afterwards is irrelevant. So in this case, why KP was given not out to us because before KP, a split second before he had the opportunity to actually hit that ball, uh, Marie called dead ball. And the reason was he applied point number six because the uh, KP was distracted by the, the slip cordon having a chatter while the bowler um, was uh, running in. If Marie did not call and signal dead ball, 
And in the in this example where KP hit the ball, would KP then uh, uh, been out? Yes, in that instance, KP would have been given out. Why? KP brought himself back into the game when he hit the ball. If KP step back, the ball gets delivered, but he makes no attempt to play at the ball, no problem. The umpire will then apply uh, point number five, where you will say, point number five is where you call and signal uh, the call and signal uh, dead ball. Let's go back to point number five. So the striker was not ready, the ball gets delivered, he backs away, and he makes no attempt to play it. But in this instance, KP, uh, so if, in the example, if um, dead ball was not called and KP and played at this ball, KP would have been given out in, in, in this example. So Tom, that is my part for this evening. I am now handing over to you. Thank you very much, Abdullah. Good evening, level two candidates. I'm going to be taking you through law 21 and 22 this evening. And just the reminder that the laws that we're taking you through are the laws that are examined in the level two exam. And we are only presenting the slides that are going to be examined. So you'll remember from level one that no ball was a very long law which took us a good 30 minutes to present uh, with slides showing a bowler overstepping the pop increase etc uh, but today i've only got two slides for you for no ball and the first slide being the introductory slide the only question on no ball in the level two exam is how can you be out from a no ball? OK, and there are three ways that a batter can be out of a no ball, and we're going to go through this in our revision questions. So please pay attention. These are hit the ball twice. Obstructing the field and run out. Those are the only three ways that a batter can be out of a no ball. They are also the only three ways that a batter can be out of a free hit. We don't present playing conditions, but we often give examples based on playing conditions because this is what we all watch and see on television. So say, for example, in a T20 international between South Africa and India, Quinton de Kock uh, is batting and we have an uh, Indian bowler, let's say Hardik Pandya bowling, and Hardik Pandya oversteps, and the Otto Noble third umpire tells the on-field umpire that that was a no-ball, so no-ball will be signaled, and the very next ball would be a free hit. That very next ball, if Quinton de Kock hits the ball up in the air. He cannot be out caught off that free hit, okay? Because the same rule applies for free hits in terms of the modes of dismissals as they do for a no ball. Um, one thing that a lot of umpires get confused on is whether a batter can be out stumped off a no ball um, sorry, off a free hit. Uh, the answer is no, you cannot be out stumped off a no ball. So you also cannot be out stumped off a free hit. Okay, very important. I've seen a couple of umpires make that mistake on the field, giving a better out stumped off a free hit. It caused a huge stir. Right, so we need to know this law, not just for the exam but also for practical application on the field. So that's it for no ball. Now we move on to wide ball. And exactly the same question is asked in the level two exam about 
a white ball. How can a better be out from a wide? And here we have four modes of dismissal that a better can be out of a wide. Hit wicket is one. Obstructing the field is another. Run out is also a method of dismissal of a wide. And the extra one, if you compare it to no ball, a batter can be out stumped of a wide. But again, remember if that delivery is a free hit, the batter cannot be out stumped. And also just remember as well, practical application. If a free hit delivery is a wide, then another, the following delivery will also be a free hit. Uh, and of course, on any free hit, a batter cannot be outstumped. Guys, I am repeating this a few times tonight because I've seen it happen and it was terrible to witness. Okay, a batter cannot be outstumped off a free hit, but if a delivery is not a free hit and it is a wide, a batter can be outstumped off a wide. We've seen that a few times where uh, spinners actually set up a batter knowing that the batter is looking to double step and charge the bowler. So the bowler fires the delivery down leg side. The wicketkeeper has probably given a signal uh, to the bowler. Mahendra Singh Dhoni was excellent at this, telling his bowlers to fire one down the leg side so that he can collect and stump the batter out of a wide. Okay, so that is a perfectly legal mode of dismissal of a wide, and so are the other three that are displayed on your screen. So that's it for me for presenting this evening. We're now going to go on to revision questions, which are covering the three laws that we have gone through. And the first one deals with dead ball. Now, Abdullah went through in a lot of detail as to when a ball automatically becomes dead. There are multiple instances when that happens, as well as when the umpire should call and signal dead ball. So the first question we're going to go through, and I'm going to ask for volunteers from the floor. Abdullah, if you can help me uh, find those and tell me whose hands were up first. We're going to ask for five volunteers to give us each an instant when the ball automatically becomes dead. OK, this is not when the umpire needs to call and signal dead ball. This is when the ball automatically becomes dead. Abdullah, do we have any yes, volunteers? Yes, Tom, we've got seven hands raised. First one was Margaret. Margaret, if you can unmute yourself and give us one of them, please. When the ball is finally settled in the hands of the wicket keeper or the bowler. Margaret, that is a textbook answer. Very well done. Whether the, you were reading that off the law book or uh, out of your uh, memory, photographic memory, uh, that is a very good answer. Thank you. Next question. Next uh, Participant, please, um, Tula. Uh, Amarjit, you and with next race, so uh, unmute yourself. Give us one, please. Okay, when the ball is uh, scored by boundary. I didn't hear you quite correctly, but I think you said when a boundary is scored. Mm -hmm. Yes, he, yes. Yeah, yes, he did. Yeah. That's correct. Yes, when a boundary is scored, nothing more can happen after that. The ball is automatically dead. Well done, Amrajit. Thank you very much. And next is uh, Pavan. Uh, greetings, all. Uh, third point is uh, when a batter is dismissed. When a batter is dismissed, Thank you. nothing else can happen after that. Well done, Pavan. Uh, cricket is not like baseball where they've got double plays and you can get the uh, more than one um uh, uh do they call them batters as well in uh, in baseball 
Uh, you can have more than one batter in baseball out in, on the same ball, but in cricket, once a batter is dismissed, uh, the ball becomes automatically dead and no further action can take place. Next one, please, Dula. Sasikant, the floor is yours. If you can unmute yourself and give us one, please. Uh, end of the game, when the game ends. Dula, I'm not sure if that's listed on the... Yeah. Answer? Yes, it is listed when the it match is, is concluded. Yeah, uh, well done, Sashikant. Correct. Thanks, Sashikant. Next one, please. Uh, Nez, Nezmi, the floor is yours. Uh, uh, when a ball is played or not, and becomes a uh, trap between the bat and person or the um, batter, uh, batter's items of clothing, or even in the clo clothing of the pyre. Excellent answer, Nazmi. And I think this is one of the situations where it is a good idea for the umpire, bowler's end, or striker's end umpire to also call and signal dead ball because not a lot of players know this law. And you'll often find that if there is a short leg in position and a batter hits the ball and then it before landing on the ground, gets stuck in between the pad flap and the thigh of the striker, then the short leg would want to come and take a catch uh, off the batter's person. But law tells us that the ball has become automatically dead. But to avoid any confusion, it is good umpiring practice for either umpire to call and signal dead ball on this particular occasion uh, so that everybody knows that the ball is dead. You obviously do not have to call and signal dead ball after a boundary. You do not have to call and signal dead ball after a batter is dismissed because that is quite obvious to everyone who plays the game that the ball is dead. Uh, but on some occasions, this one being one of them, it is a good idea to call and signal dead ball um, just to inform all the players that the ball has become automatically dead. Uh, there are more than five um, instances, Abdullah. So do we have one more volunteer to maybe get us another example of when the ball becomes automatically dead? Uh, yes, Tom. We've got Nissan. Nissan, if you can unmute yourself, please. Um when the empire calls over or time. I don't think that's correct. Um, I think if I look back at Abdullah's slides, it's important for the umpire to wait for the ball to become dead before calling over or time. The call of over or time actually does not make the ball dead okay so just be careful there because um the sequence is the ball must become dead first you must consider it to be dead um and then you call over and then if it's the end of the session you call time okay so let's have a look at the textbook answers. And as I mentioned, there are more than five. Uh, we've mentioned the ball finally settled in the hands of the wicketkeeper or the bowler. Boundary scored, batsman is dismissed. Whether played or not, the ball becomes trapped between the bat and person of a batter or between items of his or her clothing. Or it becomes lodged between the clothing or equipment of a batter or the clothing of an umpire. Uh, what we haven't mentioned is a player returning without permission and becoming in contact with the ball um, or illegal fielding. There the ball shall not count as one of the over. So the ball becomes automatically dead in those two situations, but 
a very good umpiring practice to call and signal dead ball because uh, not a lot of players know about those two instances when the ball becomes automatically dead. And then I think we also know the one where the ball goes between the wicket keeper's legs and hits the protective helmet that is placed behind the wicket keeper. There the ball automatically becomes dead. But again, very good umpiring practice to call and signal dead ball. Why? Because I think most batters and fielders know this law, but not everybody will see the ball hitting the helmet. Okay? So call and signal dead ball so that everybody knows that the ball hit the helmet behind the wicket keeper. And then we did mention that when the match is concluded, um, then the ball also becomes automatically dead. Thanks, guys. There's uh, more volunteering required because now we're going to ask you to list five instances where the umpire needs to call and signal dead ball. Again, there's more than five of them. Um, so, Abdullah, depending on how many hands there are, let's uh, give it a shot. Yeah, there's quite a few hands. Uh, Suhail, if you can give us one, please. Sorry, it's the in, uh, intervening in the case of unfair play. Well done, Suhail. That's very good. Umpire needs to call and signal dead ball when we're intervening in the case of uh, unfair play. Next one, please, Tula. Uh, Simon? Simon, if you can unmute Simon, yourself and give us one. Good evening, everyone. Um, <clears throat> when the umpire leaves his normal position to go for consultation, call time signal dead ball. Fantastic, Simon. If uh, there is a catch that has gone to yeah. second slip, but we're not sure whether as the bowlers and umpire um, did the ball carry to second slip, maybe the bowlers follow through was obstructing your view of the catch being fairly taken. Then before you go and consult with the strikers and umpire, you need to call and signal dead ball. Also ask for the ball to be given back to you. So you've got possession of the ball and then you go and consult with your partner. Um, well done, Simon. Good answer. Next one, please, Dula. Uh, Pavan, you next. A possibly serious injury to a player or umpire occurs. Thank you. Very, very good, Pavan. What's important on this one, Abdullah mentioned, is that it is up to either umpire to decide whether there is a serious injury or not. OK, if the ball flicks the bowler's finger and the bowler starts sort of shaking his hand in pain, are we going to consider that as a serious injure, injury? No, it's not a serious injury. The play must continue. But if a batter or a fielder is struck on the head and collapses to the floor, we definitely call and signal dead ball because we consider that as a serious injury. Um, there's a question in the chat box about an umpire being hit by the ball off the last ball of a match. Um, so we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, very good question. Dula, any more volunteers? Yeah, there's a few. There's still a few hands. Uh, uh, Pancho, the floor is yours. If you, if you can give us one, please. Uh, for instance, uh, when the ball uh, is unrecoverable, then they, it must be called a dead ball. Well then, Panchal, that's quite correct. Um, this law used to be a lost ball, but uh, it has now been incorporated into dead ball. Uh, the fielders used to have to call lost ball and then uh, the umpires would stop the game. But now it is up to the umpires to decide whether they feel that a ball is unrecoverable within the field of play, and then they shall call and signal dead ball. 
Thank you. Well done. Next one, please. Dula. Uh, Ramesh, if you can give us one, please. Yeah, it's uh, one or two bails on the strike case and wicket. Passed down before delivering the ball. The umpire calls a uh, sled ball. Perfect, Ramesh. And again, just important to remember that it's the strikers end wicket that the bales must fall off. If the bales come off at the bowler's end, then if the batter is not distracted or anybody else is not distracted, then play shall continue. Next, please, Dula. Uh, onikoi. Onikoi Timitope. Yeah, in a situation whereby the bowler was coming to bowl and ended up not delivering the ball. Very good, Temi Tope. Thank you for that. Um, 100% it happens quite often when a bowler loses their run-up. Uh, they still sort of run through the crease. And sometimes they even go as far as going through their bowling action, but do not release the ball. Then we call and signal dead ball. Next, please, Dula. I think we'll take two more if we have. Yeah, we've got, we've got four more hands. Uh, Tapelo. Uh, uh, that's very faint. I can't hear that. Abdullah, can you hear them? No, no, I did not. Uh, too faint. Okay. Um, maybe please type your answer into the chat box. Uh, we'll take one more uh, for this particular question, please, Dula. Arya Bavis. That's the last one. Um, I don't think it is uh, a fielder or wicket keeper, uh, wicket keeper movement uh, uh, more than two to three steps. Uh, then the strikers and empire or either empire can immediately give the dead ball before falling strike happens. Uh, Bavesh, um, that's a very good answer. Um, it's actually not noted in the dead ball law. Um, I had a look. It's noted in the uh, wicket keeper law and it's also noted in the fielder law, laws 28 and 27, uh, that if there is um, extreme movement by a wicket keeper or a fielder uh, before the delivery has been bowled, uh, then either umpire shall call and signal dead ball. Um, so you will see that it's not in the um, list of memorandum answers, uh, but if I were marking your exam paper and you gave me that answer, I would mark it correct. Uh, thank you, Bhavesh. So let's have a look quickly. I'm trying to look for any examples that were not mentioned. And uh, the example that Abdullah showed us on video of Kevin Peterson uh, was not mentioned. The striker is not ready for the delivery, and if the ball is delivered, makes no attempt to play at the delivery, provided the umpire is satisfied that the striker had adequate reason for not being ready. The ball shall not count as one of the over. Uh, the striker is distracted by any noise or movement while preparing to receive or receiving a delivery the ball shall not count as one of the over. There is a deliberate attempt to distract the striker, and there the ball shall also not count as one of the over. Um, just a piece of advice, uh, not so much for the exam, but uh, for practical purposes. Um, an umpiring colleague of ours um, in the Free State, a province that um, 
Abdullah mentioned earlier, um, said one way to remember if a ball is delivered uh, but subsequently becomes a dead ball, uh, when does it count as one for the over and when does it not count as one for the over? Um, and the simple answer is if there was something wrong that a member of the fielding side did, whether it's illegal fielding, whether it's distraction of the batter, uh, then the ball shall not count as one of the over. Whether it's coming into contact with the ball um, when the player had returned to the field without permission, then that ball will not count as one in the over. Even though the ball has been legally delivered, because of the offence by a fielder, then the ball shall not count as one for the over. Okay, so that's just a, an easy way to remember when a ball is bowled and then subsequently becomes dead, when will it not count as one for the over? Um, if the ball goes through the wicketkeeper's legs and hits the helmet, there was no um sort of illegal intervention by a fielder so that ball will count as one for the over okay just something for you all to remember on field uh, the bowler drops the ball accidentally before delivery there we also call and signal dead ball and last point is if we are required to do so under any of the laws not included above, and that, Bavesh, is where your example of a, a wicketkeeper uh, making significant change to his or her position before the ball is bowled, there we would call and signal dead ball. Okay. Um, guys, five marks there. Uh, in fact, ten marks there that... If you know your dead ball law are very easy to achieve in the level two exam. Now we need move on to um, the next question. Uh, as the bowler is approaching in his delivery stride, you notice one of the bales fall off at the striker's end. Okay, so there's a difference between if the bales fall off at the striker's end versus the bells falling off at the bowler's end. So in this example, bells have fallen off at the striker's end. What do we do? Which umpire does what? And will the ball be re or will the ball count as one for the over? Abdullah, I think you've gone through this in quite some detail. Do we have any volunteers to take us through this question? There are three hands currently raised. Uh, Tom, uh, I'm just looking to see if, I, if there's any new hands that I that I do see. I'll just give it another few more seconds. There's still a few old hands uh, that are raised. I'm just giving okay. it about five five more seconds just to check if there's any new hands that I that I see. I see a new hand, uh, um, uh, Ashish. If you can unmute yourself and give us the answer, please. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Ashish. Uh, if if the bell falls down while the baller is delivering his delivery, then then uh, either of umpire calls and signal dead ball and the, the ball will not be count. Okay, that's great. Um, the memorandum will give you one mark for that answer. Uh, level two requires a lot more detail. Um, the memorandum also states what happens if neither umpire calls and signals dead ball. What do we do then, Ashish? Um, or what happens then? 
So the ball is actually bowled. Sorry, I'm not getting your question, sir. Okay, so let's say neither umpire sees the bales fall off the striker's end wicket and the bowler also doesn't see the bales fall off. The batter also doesn't hear the bales falling off and the ball is bowled. What happens then? Is that a legal delivery? Do we play on? Or if after the ball has been bowled, we see that the bales have fallen off, do we then call and signal dead ball? Um, what do you think? Sir, if it is striker's end, then even though it is not called as, not seen by both of the umpire and keeper and batter, then also it is a dead ball. Okay, Ashish, um, let's see what the answer says. Um, good attempt. The umpire shall call a signal dead ball when one or both bells from the striker's wicket before the striker has had the opportunity of playing the ball. When one or both bells fall from the striker's wicket. In this scenario, as soon as either umpire notices that a bell has fallen off the striker's wicket, they should call and signal dead ball immediately. If neither umpire signals dead ball, play will continue as normal. Okay, so you need to add that for your second mark for this particular question. Um, yeah, Ashish, it's, it's, it's a little bit um, out of the ordinary um, that we would carry on playing with uh, bells having fallen off, uh, but this is what the law uh, directs us to do, um, especially because if nobody has heard or seen the bells fall off, then we, we can't really make a call because maybe those bales fell off because the striker stood on his stumps, uh, but we don't know. So uh, rather just let play continue and not have to make a decision from an incident that you neither umpire heard or saw. Okay, so that's a bit of a tricky one for that second mark, but... Um, Please keep that in mind on the field as well. If neither umpire hears or sees the strikers and bells fall off, play shall continue and um, no retrospective call of dead ball. Right Hello. now, here's a bit of a trick question. Um, and this does not come from any previous uh, exam papers. Um, but I thought it's quite useful in that these are rare occasions, but if it does happen, we need to know what to do on the field of play. So, Abdullah, I'm Hello, sir. the floor. Sir. This... Hello, sir. Sorry Hello. for intervening, sir. Yes. A Ashish here. Yes, Ashish. Sir, sir during the era of third umpire is it a practicable that the neither um, even though neither umpire uh, uh, watch watch the fall fall of bell the third umpire would give signal over the uh, radio call or uh, walkie talkie to the umpires um abdullah i don't know if you have read the um icc almanac interpretation of this particular law um i i, I don't think there is um a suggestion for the tv umpire to intervene and and of course uh, ashish you must remember that as much as there's a lot of cricket on television 99 percent of cricket played on the planet is not televised and there is no TV umpire. So um, for our purposes, club cricket, provincial cricket, which is not televised, we need to follow this law as written in front of us. 
Uh, Tom, to answer your question, uh, this playing condition was changed recently or brought into the Almanac. Uh, previously, um, they couldn't go upstairs, but now of recent, yes, on-field can go up to the TV umpire and ask for assistance to check whether the, the wind blew off the bells or whether the, the batter uh, tread um, on his thumbs or whatever the case may be. So to answer the question, yes, on field can go upstairs. Um, I've got a Perfect. question, if I may, please. Perfect. Um, uh, ladies and gents, we do have a question and answer session after our revision questions. So if you can hold on for another five minutes, uh, because there's only two or th there's three more questions left for us to cover um, revision questions. OK. So um, Abdullah, do we have any hands for this uh, tricky bonus points question that I've got where we need to list two instances when the umpire must call and signal no ball and thereafter immediately call and signal dead ball. And I must advise the candidates that um, the answers to these question to this question are not in the dead ball law. They are in the no ball law. 21.8 and 21.9, if anybody has got their law book uh, close by to refer to. Well, yes, Tom, we've got six hands raised. Um, I'm going to give the opportunity to, to those that did not answer yet. Um, there's no name here, but it's uh, K7. So K7, if you can unmute yourself and, and give us the answer, please. Yes, sir. Good evening to all. Uh, in this case, after the front no ball, after the front no ball, the bowler bowls the front no ball and ball hits the wicket keeper helmet. In this case, we give no ball and dead ball. Um, so K7, the, the question is asking for an immediate dead ball after a no ball, not one or two seconds later. So one incident whereby um, from that incident we call and signal no ball and we immediately call and signal dead ball. In your example, um, the call between no ball and dead ball will be about two or three seconds apart. Okay. The uh, next hand, Tom, is uh, Pavan. Pavan, if you can unmute yourself. Yes, sir. A ball coming to rest in front of the line of the striker's wicket. Perfect, so, Pavan. Ball coming to rest in front of the striker's wicket before it reaches the popping crease. Um, this happens or could happen um, in under age group cricket. So where under nines, for example, don't have the power to bowl a ball all the way to the striker's uh, wicket. If the ball comes to a halt before it reaches the pop increase, then the umpire shall call no ball and immediately after call dead ball so that the batter does not double step and try and hit a ball that has come to a standstill in front of him or her. Uh, great answer. We need one more. There's one more example of where a umpire should call and signal no ball and immediately after call and signal dead ball. There we we do have another hand raised, Tom Bavin. Uh, good evening. I was saying that a uh, ball uh, coming in a beam above the waist height and injures the batsman, uh, hitting the batsman immediately you have to call a dead ball and no ball also. That that's a fair answer. Um, not not the answer I was looking for, but um, 
I think I would definitely give you a mark for that answer. Um, it, it, it definitely can happen. But again, um, the ball hitting the striker wouldn't automatically um, be called a dead ball. We obviously need to uh, wait and see if it is inflicting serious injury on the striker before we call and signal dead ball after we've called and signal no ball because it was a waist height, a, a, a full toss above waist height. Um, so, so, so good thinking. And um, like I said, I'd definitely give you at least if it was one mark, I'd give you three quarters of a mark there. Dula, any other volunteers? Yeah, for yeah we've got Leo. There's this lots time. of hands raised, Tom. Uh, I'm mm. just looking for the uh, um, for those that hasn't given an answer yet. The um, I hope I'm pronouncing this name correctly. Uh, Olamid Akintukan. You can unmute yourself, please. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, this scenario can also occur if the ball before the batter has had the opportunity to play it touches the fielder other than the wicket keeper or the fielder intercepts the ball before the batter has had the opportunity to play it then the umpire will call and signal no ball and immediately call and signal dead ball there we go, 100%. That is exactly the answer I was looking for. So, law 21.8 uh, and 21.9 under no ball. The ball coming to rest in front of the striker's wicket shall be called and signaled no ball and immediately called and signaled dead ball. And the fielder intercepting a delivery. So, this is... This can happen if you've got a short leg fielder fielding very close to the uh, pitch and the ball is bold and it's quite wide and instead of going towards the striker, it um, goes towards the short leg fielder and is intercepted uh, by the short leg fielder or hits the short leg fielder. Uh, the umpire shall call and signal no ball and shall also call and signal dead ball. Why? Because if, for example, the striker had come down the track, premeditated pre shot, and all of a sudden um, the ball is in the hands of the short leg fielder, then even though that's a no ball, the short leg fielder could still run out the striker who has come down the track but the law says we should immediately call and signal dead ball after we've called and signaled no ball so then the fielder will not have an opportunity to affect a run out great stuff thanks for that guys that's a higher grade question and very well answered um well, two more revision questions and um, very good ones in that they quite often come up in the level two and level three exams. And also for us this evening, we have an opportunity to give seven more uh, candidates um, the ability to answer. Uh, list three ways how a batter can be out from a no ball. Um, those were one of the two slides I presented, Dula. Uh, do you yeah. have any um, yeah, there's volunteers? Loads of volunteers, Tom. Um, first hand raised was Badrunisa. Badrunisa, if you can unmute yourself and give us one of the ways that a batter can be out of a no ball. Is this is Renisha, is this Renisha, Renisha? Yeah, it is uh, Badrunisa. Okay, sorry. Um, uh, Re, uh, yeah, yes, Padre Nisa, if you can unmute yourself, please. I think Padre Nisha has gone to make a cup of tea, yeah, so uh, like it. maybe Rensha yeah. can answer for yeah, us. Uh, Rensha, if you can give us one of the ways that you can be, can be dismissed of a, of a noble, please, Rensha. Yeah, 
um, heads up, uh, going out from a no ball can be a run out. You can be run out from a no ball. Well done, Rensha. Thank you for that. Next volunteer, please, Dula. Uh, Victor, if you can unmute yourself and give us one of the ways to beat the semester for Noble, please, Victor. Hello, gentlemen. Hello, Vic. Good. Good, thanks, Vic. How are you? Okay, look. Um, actually, I, I have a question before um, before I answer, or I don't know, should I answer first and have a question after? Yeah, uh, Vic, uh, if you can give us uh, the answer, please, and then your question you can ask in the Q&A session in about five minutes' time. Okay, perfect. Look, um, I think a better can be out from a no-ball um, um, on obstruction, obstructing the thing, the, well, obstructing the field. So, yeah, yeah. Well done, Vic. Very good answer. That is uh, the second of the three modes of dismissal that a batter can be out of a no ball. Uh, we will take your question later on, Vic. Thanks for joining us. Uh, all the way from Peter Meritzburg. Abdullah, do we have yeah, we one do more have, volunteer? Um, yeah, there's lots of volunteers. I'm just, I'm just looking for, no, for names that didn't answer yet. Um, IK, IK, if you can unmute yourself and give us the third way that you can be this most of a noble, please. Good evening. Um, it's, it's hitting the ball twice. Well done. IK, interesting name. Mm -hmm. um, very good cricketing knowledge. Those are the three ways that a batter can be out of a no ball, hit the ball twice, obstruct in the field, and run out. And then for our last revision question for the evening, we ask for four ways how a batter can be out from a wide ball. And Abdullah, I'm sure we've got four volunteers to help us yeah, with this. It. Like more than 10 volunteers. <laughs> uh, uh, Paul Fransman, if you can unmute yourself and give us one of the ways that you can be dismissed of a wide ball, please, Paul. Uh, yes, good evening. Uh, when a batsman is a run out. Perfect. Run out is one of them. Probably the easiest to remember. So well done for <laughs> taking that one, Paul. Next, please, uh, uh, Next is uh, Umesh. If you can unmute yourself, please, and give us uh, the second way to be dismissed of a no of a white. Umesh. I think Umesh has been run out. Okay. <laughs> uh, next, uh, 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 Richard Tete. Is there, no, this is Umesh. Yeah, Umesh, can you give us one? And then, Richard, you next. Uh, hit wicket, very hit good wicket. answer, Umesh. Um, it's not on the screen yet, so well done. Um, the rest of the guys, I think, are copying from the uh, noble answer above. You can be out hit wicket off a wide. Well done. Yeah, and next, Richard, if you can give us the third way, please. All right, thanks, Abdullah. You're coming out of a wide when you stomped by wicket keeper. Stomped by wicket keeper off a wide, perfect. Just remember that it should not be a free hit, um, but quite correct. It is in the laws. Well done. Last one, please, Jula. Last one. Let me just have a look. Um, as I said, I'm just looking for names that hasn't answered before. Uh, Nzakuna. Uh, thank you for the uh, opportunity. I think I uh, hit the ball. I uh, hit the ball twice if it hasn't been said or obstructing the field or, or obstruction. Well done. Oh, no, you can't hit the ball twice off a wide. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> yes. You but got but obstru there. obstructing the field yeah. wasn't mentioned, right. so yeah. there you go. Okay.
Um, those are the four ways that you can be a better can be out of a wide. And that completes our revision questions for this evening. Uh, thank you very much for your interaction, ladies and gentlemen. I think that's the most number of different answers, uh, different um, candidates that we've had answering questions. So that's fantastic. Um, we don't want um, one or two people uh, hogging the microphone and uh, answering all the questions. We want everybody to get involved. And in that spirit, um, I now open up the floor to uh, questions and answers. And we're going to start with the questions that are in the chat box. Uh, Abdullah, I'm going to read them out and uh, I'm probably going to hand over most of them to you um, because you are a walking law book. So you can tell us um, why uh, K7 asks, if a bowler, and this is a question that he is still unsure of from the previous lecture, um, so let's go through that first and quickly. Uh, if a bowler starts his run up for the 46th over, but the captain decides to stop the bowler uh, and change the bowler for the 46th over, can that bowler that has been changed, who started his run up but did not bowl the ball, can that bowler bowl the 47th over, which is the very next over? K7, thank you so much for your question. According to the law, the, the second the bowler takes his first step, the over has started. So that bowler then need to complete that over. The only way that that bowler can now be changed is either the bowler needs to be injured or the bowler needs to be suspended. So, so to answer your question, the captain cannot change that bowler. The moment he took that first step, the over started, that bowler needs to complete that over. So as an umpire, you should not allow the captain to change that bowler. You need to tell the captain the bowler needs to needs to complete the over because he started the over and the over started the second the bowler took his or her first uh, step. And so, and just to emphasize again, the only way that once a, the over has started that a bowler can be changed, either the bowler needs to be injured, then you can change the bowler with another one, or the bowler needs to be suspended for whatever reason. Thanks, Tom. Very good answer. Thanks, Dula. Um, Jafta typed this question while you were presenting. Uh, you mentioned that when the wicketkeeper receives the ball and throws it to first slip, then you will consider that ball dead and nothing further can happen after that. If the first slip tries to run out the striker while the striker has gone gardening, you will call and signal dead ball because as soon as the wicketkeeper casually threw the ball to first slip, you considered the ball dead. But now Jafta asks, what if the wicketkeeper throws the ball on the ground immediately towards the stumps? Um, is the ball dead or is it still alive? Uh, thanks for your question, uh, Jafta. So when it comes to uh, judging this, so this is an uh, opinion law. So in your opinion, you need to make the call whether you feel the ball is dead uh, or not. So you looking at the scenario, you need to make that judgment call as the ball is in. Do you think the ball is dead or not? In if I just if I can just visualize your uh, scenario. I don't think in this scenario that the ball is dead. Uh, the keeper's actually uh, the, collected the ball, and now the keeper is trying to run out uh, the batter, maybe saw the batter um, um, outside uh, the crease. So in this case, I wouldn't say the ball is dead, and if it hits the stumps, I would give the batter out, um, a run out. But it's actually 
it's actually the um, decision of the strikers in umpire to make because the run out occurs if the ball was thrown at the keeper's end. The, so the point I'm trying to make is in, when it comes to this law, it is a judgment call. You need to make that call whether it, the ball is dead or not. You can actually consult your colleague. Just if you're not 100% sure, you can you can go and consult your colleague to get his or his or her opinion whether you see things that the ball is uh, dead. But yeah, judgment call, your call, in your instance, if I can visualize it, I would give the batter out a run out. Thanks, Tom. Perfect, Tula. Uh, 100% agree with you there. And, and I think it's important just for the candidates to remember that um, the law says that um, if both the fielding side and the batting side have considered the ball dead, then the ball becomes automatically dead. But in this particular instance, the wicketkeeper throwing the ball towards the stumps to attempt a run out uh, definitely does not consider the ball to be dead. So you as an umpire should also not consider the ball to be dead. Next question comes from Christo. In a T20 or a one day international, let's say the ball, the previous ball was a no ball. So the following delivery will be a free hit. Now the batter gets bowled on the free hit and the ball runs down to the boundary. The question is, is the ball dead when the ball, when the batter gets bowled? Or is it a boundary four? Because obviously a batter cannot be out bowled mm. off a free hit. Uh, thanks, Tom. Thank you for your question, Christo. Uh, just to make it clear that uh, a free hit is a playing condition that was incorporated into the uh, ODI uh, playing conditions as well as the, the, the T20 playing conditions. Free hit is not part of the laws of uh, cricket. Uh, but to answer Christo's um, uh, question, so in a T20 or a uh, 50 over game or ODI, the um, free hits are applicable. And the moment you uh, the there is a no ball, any type of no ball, whether it's foot fault, whether it's a fielding infringement, those are all also part of the playing conditions for T20 or ODIs. The next ball will then be a free hit. And there's only three ways that you can be dismissed of a free hit. It's the same as as how um, uh, you can be dismissed of a no ball, so you can only be dismissed, uh, hit the ball twice, obstructing the field, and run out. So that, those are the only three modes of dismissals, how you can be dismissed um, of a free hit. So now in this scenario, on the free hit ball, the bowler gets bowled. So I've just mentioned that you can, that can there's only three ways that you can be dismissed of a free hit. And bold is not one of them. So now you cannot be bold of the free hit delivery. So meaning because you cannot be bold, that ball will then not be deemed the moment it hits uh, the stumps, the ball would not be deemed dead because you cannot be bold of a free hit. So the ball then goes against the stumps, dislodges the bales, the ball then ricochets towards the boundary, and goes over the boundary. So I've just said that you cannot be bowled. So the ends, the ball then does not become dead the moment it hits uh, the stumps. So in this instance, if the if there was no contact with either the bat or any part or, or the pad or any part of the person, and the ball then went against the stumps and went um, over the boundary the signal will then be as follows. Those the runs will be allowed. If you did make contact with the bat, you will then give boundary four. Those four runs will then 
uh, go towards the batsman. So your signal to the scorers will only be boundary four. If there was no contact with anything, nor the bat, nor any part of the person, your signal will be as follows. You need to signal the, the buy signal and wait for the scorers to acknowledge. And then you need to signal boundary four and wait for the scorers to acknowledge. The reason why you need to signal by, because if you're not going to signal by, the scorers are going to, uh, and only signal the four runs, the scorers are going to assume that the batter made contact with the ball and they're going to allocate those four runs against the, the striker's name. Uh, if the ball made contact with the pad and then ricocheted onto the stumps and then went over the boundary, you will, your, your um, signal will be as follows. You will tap your raised knee uh, with your hand, wait for the scorers to acknowledge the leg by, and then you will signal boundary four and wait for the scorers to acknowledge. Thanks, Tom. Perfect, Dulak. Thank you. Next question is from uh, Rentia. And I will take this one because it's happened to me on the field. Yeah, all yours. If the bowler bowls the ball and the batter strikes the ball and hits you as the bowler's end umpire on the leg and carries on rolling, do you play on or do you call dead ball? So, Club Champs final in Pretoria in 2015, um, University of Stellenbosch against Crusaders from Durban. The batter was David Beddingham, who um, has played for the Cobras in Western Province recently and also plays for Derbyshire in the English county cricket. He hit the ball straight back down the ground and the ball ricocheted off the bowler's end stumps and that ricochet then hit my shin but it was struck so hard that it still went down to long off and the law says that if an umpire or player is seriously injured, then uh, either umpire shall call and signal dead ball. Um, I didn't realize that I was seriously injured <laughs> and I wasn't really seriously injured. Um, so I did not call and signal dead ball. Play continued. They ran uh, two runs. Uh, I can guarantee you if the ball had not hit my shin, it would have gone straight down the ground for four um, because the long off fielder would not have gotten close to it. It was hit that hard. Um, so I actually unfortunately denied them uh, two runs and they lost the match um, in the last over by one wicket. Um, so who knows, maybe I... I I changed the result or, or was part of the reason of the result. But it was in the first innings of the match, not the second innings of the match. Uh, but the point I'm trying to make, Rencher, is that um, if you do not consider the umpire or the player that has been hit by the ball seriously injured, then the play carries on. And we saw um, earlier in the week or last week where um, in the England versus New Zealand test match, ball was hit straight back down to the non-striker. The non-striker trying to get out the way ended up hitting the ball in the air to mid off and the striker was out court. So play continues if the ball ricochets off a batter the non-striker or a fielder or an umpire unless anybody is seriously injured. Okay, so I hope that answers your question there, Renji. Uh, next, we move on to another question by K7. If the ball hits an umpire 
or the player, will the ball be dead? Um, I think we probably covered this. The ball will be, and if it is dead, will the ball be re-bowled? Um, if it is dead, will it count as one for the over? Um, if it is counted as a legal delivery in the over, what happens if it's the second innings of the the match and the batting team needs two runs to win and the umpire has intervened and actually stopped those two teams, sorry, those two runs from being taken because the ball has hit him or her. So I think K7, just like the example I've just given, in the final, uh, that ball would have gone for four if it didn't hit me. Um, but unfortunately, they were only able to run two runs because um, it hit me. So, yeah, it does happen. And it's unfortunate for the batting side. Uh, but the ball does count as one of the over. And unless a, a player is seriously injured, you carry on and the batters have to run player or umpire seriously injured, you call and signal dead ball. But even if you do call and signal dead ball, uh, the ball does still count as a legal delivery in the over. Next question is from Olamide. If the ball had gone down the hole, and I think this refers to your meerkat example in Namibia, Abdullah, Mm -hmm. How long would you have waited before calling and signaling dead ball, keeping in mind that the batters would have kept running between the wickets before you called and signaled dead ball? Thank you for your question, Ola Mede. Uh, that is exactly why this law was, uh, was brought in. For the umpire to intervene, because if you're not going to intervene, the batters then have the opportunity to run... 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 uh, 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 runs, uh, if possible. So it was brought in for, for the umpire to intervene. So the moment the ball goes down the, the hole, that is when I would have called and signaled dead ball. But then it's important, and you can uh, uh, consult your colleague, because you need to then judge where the batters and how many runs were completed that second that you called dead ball. So you need to, if let's say the batters completed two runs and they crossed on the third when the, the call of dead ball came, three runs will accrue to the, the batting side. So, so to answer your question, I would call it immediately as soon as the ball goes down the hole. But it's important all the runs that was completed and the run in progress, if they cross at the instant of of the call of dead ball, will also count. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Dula. Next question is from Musa. What happens if the bales on the wicket at the bowler's end, umpire, falls as the bowler is about to deliver the ball. Play is allowed to continue according to law. The batsman strikes the ball and there is a run out at the end of where the bells have dropped. Would that run out be legitimate? So imagine both bells are off, Dula, mm -hmm. and now we need to affect a run out. How do we do that with both bells being off the stumps. Thanks for your question, Musa. There are only three ways that now a, a, a runout can be effected. And remember, in this scenario, the bowl, the bells were on the stumps as the bowler um, came running in. And let's say, for argument's sake, the wind blew off the, the bells at the bowler's end uh, while the bowler was in his delivery stride. He still delivered the ball, the batter hits it, and now the batter starts, uh, let's say the batter hits it into the covers, and they start running. So now, the only way with the bales now not being on top of the stumps, 
you can only put down the wicker as follows. You can either take the ball or um, firstly, the fielding side can put the two balls back on. Uh, don't think it would be possible because the uh, you know time wise uh, wouldn't allow that. But there's nothing stopping the fielding side from putting the balls back onto the stumps and breaking the wickets. Remember that only the fielding side can do it. The umpire shall not put the ball, the balls on while the ball is still in play. They should they must leave it. They can only put the balls back on once the ball is dead. But if the ball is still in play in this scenario, the fielding side can put the back on and break the wicket in that way. That's the first uh, instance. But usually that's going to take a bit of time. I don't think that's going to happen. If this, these things happen so quick, I don't think the fielding side would want to put balls back on and then breaks the stumps. So how else can you break, uh, break the stump? You can break uh, the stumps by taking the ball and throwing any of the three stumps out of the ground. But the important part is the ball needs to be thrown so hard and what and any of the three stumps needs to be removed from the hole. If they need, need to be out of the ground. That's the one way. Second way, you can use your hand with the ball in it and you can eat a stump out of the ground. Or stumps, but they need to be out of the ground. That's the third way. Sorry, the second way. And the third way is you can remove the stump, but this needs to be simultaneously. If you can just visualize this, you've got the ball in your right hand and you take your left hand, you take the stump and the ball, you hold the ball together against the stump. And in one motion, you then remove the stump from, from its uh, um, groove or stump out of the hole. So ball in one hand, uh, let's say the right hand, you take the stump in the left hand, you put the ball against the stump, and then simultaneously you lift the stump out of the ground. So those are the three ways that you can now put the wicket down if the ball, um, if the bales fell off while the bowler was, uh, um, let's say, delivering the ball. Thanks, Tom. Perfect, do that. Very thorough answer for Musa and all the other candidates. Our next question is from Pavan, uh, admin question. Well, why is no ball and wide not covered in detail in level two? Um, I didn't attend level one, so I don't know. Uh, please excuse me. Uh, Pavan, uh, you are excused, no, no problems. Um, the reason that we do not cover all the laws in all the details is that they are not all examined in thorough detail in the level two exam. The purpose of this course is to prepare um, the candidates for the level two exam, Cricket South Africa's level two umpiring mm -hmm. exam. Um, so we cannot go through all the laws in all the detail. Um, as we did in level one. Um, what I can do for you is if you type in your email address into the chat box, I can send you the level one presentation, which has all 42 laws in detail. It's a 380 plus slide presentation versus the 94 slide presentation that we're going through for level two. In level two, we focus more on revision questions than we do on presenting every single law in all the detail that we did in level one. Thanks for that question, Pavan. Uh, next question I'm going to take is from Tim. And Tim, I think maybe you might have to just elaborate on this. I'm going to read it out. But um, if it doesn't make sense to Abdullah, then if you can unmute yourself and talk us through it. Um, Tim says, good evening, guys. With regards to club cricket in South Africa, can a club use a rolled up pitch for any club games for under 13 girls and under 19 girls? So, Abdullah, I think those are those strips that uh, you sometimes find you we use in Cape Town for CPL 
um, under 11, for example. Um, is that allowed for under 13 club matches, girls, and under 19 uh, girls club matches? Do you yeah. know? I, I'm, I'm not sure. I also think Tim is referring to those roll-up um, mats. And back in my playing days, uh, we already played on, on t- t- turf uh, pitches. Um, it's only afterwards even that those green uh, um, synthetic um, uh, mat pitches came in. But initially when I started playing, it was those rolled up, uh, um, trying now to just, just um, rolled up mat uh, type, of, type of pitches. Uh, according to my knowledge, uh, there's nothing, I, I can't remember there's anything in the, in the school or girls playing conditions that stops club from using uh, those roll up uh, um, mats. Um, so you can re- use those mats. So back in my day as well, some clubs had those mats. Some had this uh, the green synthetic mat. Um, some clubs had turf wickets, and we played on all three uh, uh, school cl- cricket and club cricket. Yeah. So so I I don't see any issue uh, if a club's got one of those rolled up mats available that uh, games can be played uh, girls under 13 or under 19 can be played on 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 those on those rolled up mat pitches agreed thanks Tula. Uh, next question is from temi tope is there a situation whereby a batter hits the ball twice and there was no appeal can the umpire give the batter out with no appeal for hit the ball twice. So thanks for your question, Timitopi. So uh, so when it comes to the mode of this muscle, hit the ball twice, it needs to be, uh, the batter needs to willfully hit the ball twice. So I'm assuming in your scenario, the batter willfully hit the ball twice. Uh, f- for an umpire to give a batsman um, out on any mode of this muscle, there needs to be an appeal from the fielding side. If there was no appeal on any mode of this muscle, whether it's bold, caught, uh, stumped, run out, any mode of this muscle, the umpire cannot give the batter out if there has been no appeal. Thanks, Tom. Correct me if I'm wrong, Dula. I thought uh, bold is the only uh, dismissal that does not require a an appeal. Yeah, uh, yeah. The, technically, I mean, nine out of ten times, it's so obvious to to everyone. Uh, mm. but, uh, but, but sometimes the ball might just graze the the the, the bail and the bail mm. falls off, and and then the, the fielding side there would be this huge appeal. Um, and then uh, usually umpires would come together, you know, have a chat um, and uh, consult. So, so 99% of the time, there usually wouldn't be an appeal. But instances where you're not sure, um, okay. I, I saw fielding sides appeal for, for those. But those are just 1% of the time. Okay. Especially when uh, you're playing without bails. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And... That's, yeah that's a good example. Yes, Tom. Okay. Perfect. Thanks, Tula. Um, then we still have a hand up, uh, Temi Tope. Um, do you have another question or were you putting your hand up for the question we've just answered? Yes, um, I do. It's actually not a question, but I had a scenario that actually happened. So I want to be sure about it. There was um, a ball, it was on the last ball, the last sixth ball of the over. The last sixth ball was a wide ball. Then there was a stomp of the wide ball. So I was actually the standing umpire. Then I declared the wide ball. As at that time, the batter was walking out and home. I actually forgot I had the last ball to go. So my partner on the other end, didn't remind me, even the third umpire we had did not remind me until we're about bowling the next over, like the the bowler was actually running to his crease, was Mm -hmm. when 
they brought it out and noticed like a tremendous in the last one. I was like, <laughs> so, I don't know if the third umpire was the one that was supposed to add, and maybe when he had seen both of us not being sure, maybe we've forgotten or something. I think the communication should have come from him, or who do you think should have given us that before the bowler starts in the next over? Great scenario, Temi Tope. And, and I always enjoy um, answering questions on scenarios that actually happened. Um, sometimes uh, us as umpires can come up with weird and wonderful scenarios that haven't happened, and it's difficult to picture them, but um, in your scenario, it actually happened, so it's it's easy to, to talk through it. Uh, I actually had a, uh, almost a similar uh, incident uh, at Newlands Cricket Ground. It was a franchise one-day competition um, between the Dolphins and the home side, the uh, Cobras, as they were named at the time. And Abdullah was my um, TV umpire. And um, we called over after five legal deliveries. And Abdullah, as the awesome TV umpire that he is, he checked on his screen, his TV screen, the number of balls that were bowled, and there were five. He still went and double checked with the scorers, and the scorers only had five balls. And on his um, tracking sheet, he also only had five balls bowled for the over. So then he got onto the radio and he informed me that um, only five balls were bowled in that over. Uh, even though I had already called over, um, we needed to go back and bowl the sixth delivery in that over. Um, and at this point, I was almost at my position of uh, square leg for the following over. So, and in fact, um, my on-field partner had already received the cap from the bowler who was going to bowl the next over. So we were quite far down the process in terms of starting the next over. Um, thankfully, the... Bowler had not started uh, his run-up from for the next over, because if the bowler had started his run-up for the next over, then we could not have gone back. Um, however, the bowler had not started his run-up for the next over, so we could go back. Um, we basically uh, revoked the call of over, and we all got back into position to bowl the sixth ball of uh, my over from my end. So the point I'm trying to make, Timmy Tope, is that um, up until the bowler, the next bowler starts the run-up for the next over, you can go back and complete your over. Um, whose responsibility is it to um, make sure that six legal deliveries have been bowled? Uh, you as a team of umpires, and remember that if there are two, three, four umpires, then you are all a team and you should work together to help each other in any way you can to make sure that the game is played um, as it should be played. So I don't think the law states anywhere uh, which particular umpire is in charge of counting balls. Uh, however, we do know that the bowler's end umpire calls over. Um, so, so I suppose um, the response, the final responsibility, lies with the bowler's end umpire in terms of counting the deliveries and also communicating when the over has been bowled. Um, so I took it on the chin. Um, it's it's everybody's fault, but you as the bowlers and umpire are highlighted the most when a over is miscounted. Uh, so let that be a learning experience for you, and hopefully it doesn't happen again uh, in terms of miscounting an over. I hope that answers your question, Temi Tope. 
Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Uh, Nanesh, I see your hand is up. Um, I know you're going to ask us a lot of questions and you're going to tell us all about your international game yesterday. Uh, before we go to you, I want to come back to Victor because he wanted to ask a question during the revision questions. Uh, Vic, are you still with us? Can you unmute your microphone and ask ask your question, please? OK, um, thanks. Uh, thanks for giving me a platform. <laughs> OK, so my question is, I'm not sure if because I missed the past two sessions. So now my question is now, let's say a bowler bowls, all right? So let's say a bowler bowls and then what's happening is he like he he will say something before the ball man before the better strikes the ball so what what do you call that do you call it a, uh, a no ball or a dead ball a oh, very good question uh, vic and it's it it happens quite often with spin bowlers i've noticed where yeah. um they bowl the ball and they think it's a great ball and they they shout uh something like hey girl and um they actually shout before the batter has had a chance to play at the ball um and law 41 covers it quite nicely uh, i think it's 41.5 a uh, deliberate distraction of the striker and the punishment is quite uh, severe uh, it's five penalty runs, call and signal, dead ball, and the batters get to choose which end uh, the next batter is going to, um, who's going to face the next ball. Uh, and we also have to report that player. Uh, however, in practice, what we do, um, Vic, is if we feel that the striker has not been distracted by that um shout or that appeal or that bit of excitement from the bowler uh we will not call and signal dead ball and implement all those punishments we will just have a quiet word to the bowler and say bowler you are not allowed to distract the striker before he or she has had a chance to play at the ball so please wait until after the shot is played before you make any screams, shouts, comments um, or appeals. Um, so that's how we handle it on the field. Abdullah, I don't know if you um, have had such experience and how you've handled it yourself. Uh, similarly, Tom, I only interfere if, I, if in my opinion, I feel the batsman was distracted. Uh, if, if then, I will intervene. If not, I, I'll allow the play to continue. Perfect. Thanks, Dula. Uh, right. Um, Nanesh, you, the floor is yours. Uh, I see Bavesh also has his hand up. So uh, maybe give us one question and then we'll move to Bavesh and we can come back to you if you want uh, more questions or discussions. Uh, Nanesh, please unmute your microphone and give us a go. Hello, Tom. Uh, hello, Abdullah. Hi, Nanesh. Are you able to hear me? Mm -hmm. Loud and clear. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, the first question is about uh, the wicket keeper throwing the ball um, instead of throwing to the slip fielder uh, with the batsman out of his ground uh, and not attempting a run. And that's the two different things. I think uh, Abdullah forgot to mention. He mentioned his uh, run out. Um, I think uh, there are two things. When the batsman is not trying to run, and then it's stumped. And the batsman, when trying to uh, run, and then it's going to be run out. Uh, if I'm not correct, Abdullah. Uh, yes, Nanesh, you are correct. So if the keeper throws the ball at the stumps, and the batter was not attempting a run and he's outside his crease, you will be out stumped. If the, if the keeper throws the ball at the stumps and the batter try to run, uh, the batter will then be out run out. Yes. Thank you. 
and this another one is uh, about the exam and is there any reason that uh, you cover only the few last for the level 2 instead of all the last a bigger pardon nanesh oh, uh, is there any special reason to cover only few laws uh, for the level 2 exam instead of um, the complete 42 laws uh, yes, uh, Nanesh, we go into detail on the laws and the specific parts of each law that are examined in the level two exam. If we had to go into detail of every law and every part of every law, then we would take 50 lectures instead of seven lectures. So um, like I said, uh, in level one, we go into detail of um, most laws, or in fact, all the laws, 40, oh, the first 40 laws. But in level two, the purpose of this course is to prepare candidates for the Cricket South Africa level two exam. Um, and that is why we are skipping some laws and also for example, law 2021 20, and 22, which we presented today, we didn't go into all the slides on level one that we would have gone into for those particular laws. So we are only covering the material that is examinable. Yeah. Okay, Tom. Um, uh, Bavesh, you may ask, uh, yes, yeah. Yeah. Bavesh, you've got your hand up. If you can unmute your microphone and uh, give us your question, please. Uh, thanks, Tom. Um, I have a question related to your answers regarding counting the balls. I have recent uh, a scenario happen uh, last Sunday game uh, where my colleague was a bowling ends empire and I was at the strikers and empire. Uh, he counted five balls and uh, he counted six balls uh, where I counted five balls, but he already said over. He was walking towards his uh, striker center uh, or leg side and I was approached to the bowling ends and the same time scorers uh, shouted or, or tried to let us know that it was only five balls and I right away uh, response i said it is over it's okay now we have to move on to the next over was it a right decision here or i should have gone to the striker uh, to my colleague hey you miscounted it was five balls uh, or how should i handle that situation abdullah you want to take that one first you can take it down Just uh, taking a body break. Oh, that. sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah. So the um, yeah. So I'll, I'll take it, Tom. You can take a body break. The so so what, what you do is bowlers in. Were you bowlers in or strikers in? Strikers in. The, uh, was this uh, was this a uh, uh, one day game, five day game, um, was it a tight game? It was fifty over game. Oh, it was it was it was limited over game. And um, so what I will what I will do is, so there was a discrepancy between the two of you. So usually you you um, when you signal two two to go, did you guys see did the two of you signal two balls to go? Did you not pick up there was a discrepancy with two balls to go? Uh, yeah, we did signaling uh, each other. But then so, after one, there was a white ball happened. And yeah. uh, he must have counted and he carry on. And then after one ball, we supposed to do again signaling. We did not did that part. And he already went ahead with the over and then I came to my end, to bowling end after the over. Uh, and then after scorer have uh, asked, hey, it is five balls only. But then I re responded back, it is over. Now it's OK. Empire already made his decision yeah, so because he was at the bowling end. 
Uh, yeah, so that's why it's so important that you do get your counting right. Even if there is a white ball, you should have confirmed two. Uh, you should have confirmed after the white ball was bowled how many uh, balls left. But so in in your scenario, if you just uh, apply the law, if the umpires miscount, the over will stand. So if you just go according to law, what you did was 100% correct. You've miscounted. You know, your over will stand, but in a limited over game, in a tight game, and if there is a a, a discrepancy, I would have uh, I would have um, just confirm, especially if uh, um, if um, confirm with the scorers. Scorers, are you happy that this one that this one ball left? But remember, you strikers in, so bowlers in. In this case, it was. For the you know the buck stopped really with him. If he was adamant that it was over and he walked away, uh, you know there's nothing you can do according to the law that over will will stand. But I would have confirmed with the scorers how many balls left because for me, especially in one day cricket, there's nothing worse. Tight game, end of the game, um, the scorers will highlight uh, there was a five ball over and the side loses by one or two runs. They're going to make a big thing about it. Uh, it will take you five, ten seconds, to, you know, to confirm how many balls left. Yes, a bit of egg on your face, but it will have saved you so much uh, uh, agony and press at the end, at the end of the game. But now to answer your question, as per the law, um, he called over. Yes, he made a mistake. Um, you continued playing. If the umpire miscount, that overstands place I'll just uh, continue so I can't fault you on the law yeah, but yeah in in future uh, uh, especially one day cricket rather just make sure that um, with the scorers uh, um, but before even getting to the scorers if there's two balls left you show two balls the next ball was a wide you should have confirmed again two balls um, two balls left in the over if he wasn't looking at you, you should try to get his attention just to make double check with him. Two balls left. Um, even when there was uh, one ball left, you should have just tried to get his attention just to confirm one ball left. So try everything on the field to get your counting 100% right. Uh, if still confusion, take five or ten seconds. Ask the scorers. If both scorers are happy, there's still one left. I would then go with the scorers and I would have bowled that ball. As long as the next ball of the next of the following over has not been uh, bowled, you still save. Tom's mentioned his easy example that we had. Uh, it was a televised game. Uh, it didn't look good, but the captains were happy because we uh, end of the day we got uh, the correct decision was made. We allowed the, the sixth ball of the over to be bowled. Did I answer your question? Thanks, thanks. Yes, Abdullah. Thanks a lot. Uh, really appreciate it. No, you're welcome. Thanks, Dula. Thanks, Pavesh. Great question. Nanesh, I think um, we can now go on to your game yesterday. How did it go? And do you have any uh, questions or comments that you want to raise on it? Uh, yes, the game went really well. Um, there are two things uh, which I just want to tell and the first one is uh, it happened in the second over of the match uh, the bowler bowl um, a ball and the ball hit the bales and the bale had broken the two pieces so instead of we uh, asked the the groundsman I used the bale uh, which I normally carry to every match uh, after the first match, uh, I, as I started my empiring. Uh, I always carry one bale with me. Luckily, uh, I used that bale uh, yesterday. So, I never expected that uh, I'm going to use that bale which I'm carrying to every match. Uh, so, that's one good thing uh, that happened yesterday. And we continue the game and we change the bale um, after the first innings. Uh, that's one thing, and the, the captains agree to forego the drinks break. So that saved some time only, uh, but that was um, 
low scoring game and it was going quick so the captain says okay they don't want the drinks uh and another one which uh, so it's definitely for me to do some homework or maybe uh, uh, i need to do some uh, i need to make a routine to do this uh, what happened is uh, i was at the bowling bowler side amping uh, non striker uh, non striker side bowler side and the spinner is bowling and he the batsman uh, trying to flick the ball is uh, towards the leg stump and the batsman trying to flick it and uh, the ball uh, the bat hit the ground and the ball brushes the bat of the batsman which i did not recognize and then um, brushed the keeper keeper's bat as well uh, i thought it's the only the keeper's bat uh, i'm giving white uh, but the square the umpire who was at uh, the striker end he is already tapping his leg uh, which i did not observe uh, normally i always see my partner when there is an appeal uh, for the lbw to see whether there is an uh, about the height or maybe there is an age and normally we used to communicate like it one i think i hope you already do that and so i normally do when there is an appeal uh, but yesterday i did not see my colleague and i signal white and then the boy says oh no it's uh, your colleague is also telling it to hit the pad and i said oh then i saw him i was like oh i should have done this one as well and then i revoke my um, white signal and then i gave leg by signal and after the match we discussed uh, about that one and then um, my colleague also told it's always better to check with your colleague once just a split second just watch your colleague and then i said okay normally when i look only when there is an appeal uh, but um, i still have done this one as a protein to see most of the balls when i'm not sure whether uh, it hit the bat or pad and that's the thing and yeah those are the only the main things and that another one is i wrote down all the um, timings when the wicket fell uh i know down the over and how the batsman got out and uh, the time when the batsman got out and um, my colleague says it's not not necessary normally the scorers will write down all the things um but i got one tip from one of the empires uh it's always nice to write down the overs and especially the time when the batsman got out um because of the appeal maybe uh, the time of appeal uh, in case the next batsman um that did not arrive uh, into the crease by on time if there is an uh, appeal for the time out then uh, we should be able to tell the batsman or the fielding captain when the last batsman got out so i still uh, keep on writing those uh, that time when the batsman got out and uh, yeah that's it and those are the things um, that happened yesterday uh, rest went really well uh, counting wise very good uh, communication wise uh, well done um, so both captains are okay they're happy uh, the communication and uh, on field uh, decisions except that only one wide and leg by call which i also a bit i was also a bit uh, yeah, disappointed and i lost concentration uh, after that one but um yeah as you told uh, monday um i always said okay keep um leave the uh, thing what happened and then concentrate on the next ball uh, that took me i think um, two or more hours before um I completely ignore uh, what happened uh, i think that's a long time actually uh, which i still need to uh, do some uh, homework uh, to ignore and maybe put it back um, what happened in the last ball also yeah that's it uh, yes um, yeah it's very good game uh, but some learning as well uh, every day um, you learn every day so one, at least one thing in every match thank you for the feedback nanesh and um, i'll i'll give some comments on a few of your points uh, first thing to remember 
is that we all are still learning. Um, Maria Rasmus voted the number one umpire in the world last year and a couple of other times before that. Um, he says that he's still to this day learning something new. Uh, maybe not every game, but every now and then something comes up that's different to anything he's ever experienced and he learns from it. So don't be shy to learn. Don't think you know everything. Nobody knows everything. And there's always a weird and wonderful scenario that could come up that you've never seen before that you will learn from. Um, your carrying of a spare bail, very good umpiring practice. Um, I would suggest you always carry two heavy bales in your back pocket. Um, in Cape Town, we've got a lot of wind where the light bales provided by the clubs often blow off after very small breezes. So get yourself a pair of a set of heavy bales, um, 40 grams per bale, uh, maybe even up to 50 grams per bale and make sure that you always have two. In fact, even if you can carry four with you, because sometimes your partner might not have heavy bells, then you must provide for both ends. So well done on having a spare bell. It looks really good, um, but having four heavy bells would look even better. Uh, then you mentioned the wide down leg side, which was actually a leg by. Um, a tip that a lot of us uh, use is call and signal no ball as early as possible, but call and signal wide ball as late as possible. So you must take all the clues and all the evidence that you have at hand before calling and signaling wide ball. Why? Because especially with the slower deliveries. Um, you might think the ball has gone past the batter and it's gone past the bowler. Uh, sorry, it's gone past the, the, the batter's stumps, but it actually hasn't. And something happens late on. There's a late cut played by the batter. And you were just about to call wide, but actually the ball has been played. Similarly, um, whenever the ball goes down leg side, it's actually quite easy to have a look at your partner at striker's end because he normally stands down the leg side at square leg. So have a look at your partner first to see if he is signaling anything. Um, and your partner was signaling that it was a leg by and not a wide. Um, the best umpires signal wide if they are standing at um, striker's end to show the bowler's end umpire that they haven't heard anything. So the ball's gone down wide. Sorry, the ball's gone down leg side. So then it should be given wide in terms of the playing conditions for limited overs cricket. Okay, so so if I'm a square leg umpire or striker's end umpire and the ball goes down the leg side um, and I haven't heard it hit pad, bat, anything, then I'm just going to show a small signal of wide to my partner so that if my partner from bowler's end umpire looks, then he will see that I'm happy for him to give wide. Um, so remember, it's still your call as bowler's end umpire. It doesn't mean if your Strikers and umpires show it's wide that you must call wide. Um, but it's just to keep up that communication between the two of you. Um, and then lastly, in terms of um, putting decisions behind you in a match, it's not only the out and not out decisions that you need to put behind you. You will find that the higher you go um, in umpiring, the more players are looking at decisions like wide and like no ball, especially in limited overs cricket, especially with no balls. 
because if it's a no ball, then it's an extra delivery and it's a free hit. And that free hit could be the difference between a score of uh, 150 in a T20 game and 160 in a T20 game. Okay, probably 156, not 160. But point I'm trying to make is um, players are not only concerned about your out or not out decisions, they're also concerned about the wide and low ball decisions. So if those are questioned and if you do get them wrong like you did yesterday, you need to put those behind you as soon as possible, similarly to how you try and put the out or not out incorrect decisions behind you as soon as possible. So yeah, I hope that helps and um, all the best going forward. Um, you Thanks, are, Tom. Uh, one, one, one thing you need to know as well is that, I don't know about anywhere else in the world, but here in South Africa, when we are appointed to a specific game, we will never be appointed to a game where the match secretary, the person who appoints us, thinks that we are not good enough to umpire in that game. Okay, so so even though it might you might feel like you you don't belong there, you must know that you have been given that match because you qualify in terms of your. Um, qualification and experience and the person that has appointed you to that game believes that you are at the level to umpire in that game and confidence makes a huge difference in a umpire's performance uh, similar to how it makes a huge difference in a player's performance so you need to be confident in your ability and confident that you belong at that level that you've been appointed and that will give you a head start in, instead of being nervous and feeling like you don't belong there. Uh, and your body language would give you away if that's the feeling that you're carrying as you go on to the match. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Uh, sure, definitely. I will work out and I will make sure some routines as well. And I will do some homework to improve my empowering and then uh, my mental strength as well. Uh, I feel that one also, uh, one of the games uh, when there was three twenty three T twenty games has been played in one day, sure. and um, I was one of the empire uh, for one match. Um, I was a third empire, and then the rest of the two matches I was on field. So it was a little bit uh, long day. So those things also, I think at the end, we feel like, oh, this is too long and exhausted and those things. So then at the end, we came I mean, the three empires were discussing yet. Yeah, I think those are the mistakes, mistakes, and maybe this is this is because of the long day. So um, there's a lot of things to make mistake. Um, and also we need to improve to, I, at least I need to improve to put them behind as well. So. Yes. Thank you, Tom. Uh, thank you, Abdullah, for the tips. Keep going. There's no substitute for experience. The more time you spend on the park, the better you will get. Uh, Pavesh, is that a new hand or is that an old hand from your previous question? Uh, it is the old hand from previous question, but I just have a small question now arise. I uh, last um, um, session after finishing I've dropped one email by any chance you have received that email uh, about the Empire tool equipments uh, yes Pavesh I did get that uh, email and I did screenshot it from my phone and sent it to um, Mohammed Juma he did say he would respond to you um, I'm surprised he oh, hasn't okay. yet um, because he's usually quite quick at responding, but uh, I'll maybe just send him a reminder on WhatsApp to get back to you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Tom. I still now, until now, I haven't received any email uh, from him, but but uh, really appreciate it. Thanks, thanks. You're welcome, Pavesh. And you are all welcome uh, to join us again next week, Monday for our next lecture where we will go through laws 24, 27, 28 
and 29, if I'm not mistaken. Um, once again, a reminder that we're only going through the laws that are examined and the parts of the laws that are examined in the Cricket South Africa Level 2 exam. I see one person has put in their email address for me in the chat to add, uh, to send them the Level 1 presentation where all the laws are covered in detail. So I will do that. If there's anybody else who wants the Level 1 presentation who hasn't got it, please um, put your email address in the chat box. Uh, Shiv Shankar Pandit, your hand is up. Unmute your mic. Yeah, I have a question. So I was just browsing through and I came across uh, the ICC Academy uh, um, for Empowering by Simon Toffel. So the price for level two was like, I think above $1,000. So my question is that, is there anything uh, superior that the prices are so much? <laughs> it's like a lot of difference, to be honest, to what I'm what we are going to pay here. And so my question is that how does it is it just the, is uh, the brand which is which is asking for the money or what, what is it? Uh, Shiv Shankar, good question. And I've been asked by a few people uh, the same question. Um, what is it? <laughs> I think I think there's yeah. Um, so we all know Simon Telfel was the number one umpire in the world for five consecutive years, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, and right. and he has been employed by the ICC um, for the last ten years, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he's obviously probably the best person to learn from if you want to become a world class umpire. Um, the decision came around because all associations um, worldwide have different level ones, different level twos, and different level threes. So I think the ICC is trying to standardize the qualification, um, but maybe also make it exclusive, uh, just judging by that price. So I don't know what the level one looks like, the level two looks like, and the level three looks like that the ICC are offering. Um, but uh, by the I, way, I don't think. Sorry, I'm interrupting you. Sorry, mm -hmm. uh, but, but I, I I think the heat it is just his own organization which is created because it has nothing to do with ICC. Because if it was the same, that would have been integrated together. So I see the it's just not integrated the same website. So I think they are both are two different organization. So yeah. Okay. Anyways, please go ahead. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. Too. So. Um, so so I, I thought it was an ICC qualification, um, which which would make sense because they, you know, at the moment, the ECB has got their own level one, level two, level three. Uh, Cricket Australia has got their own level one, two and three. BCCI have got their own levels. Um, so, so I thought the ICC wanted to make a standardized qualification. And we have run into this issue whereby um, one of our previous level one courses was attended by a um, new umpire in United Arab Emirates. And I gave him the contact of a former South African umpire who's now based in Dubai, who um, is only too happy to recruit new umpires because they're short of umpires in, in the UAE. Um, but the Asian Cricket Association that the UAE are uh, under, um, they, they're not happy to accept a new umpire based on the Cricket South Africa Level 1 qualification. So that uh, gentleman has to write um, the UAE or the Asian level two exam and then he would be able to start umpiring in the uae so um unfortunately we currently are in a situation whereby um different uh, countries have different qualifications and some countries are happy to accept qualifications from other countries but 
some countries are not happy to accept qualifications from other countries. So I thought the ICC had um, got Simon Tafel to get this idea of standardizing a qualification. And I think our currency uh, just globally, South African currency is quite weak. So um, yeah, you'll find that uh, something that is expensive in South Africa is not converted to um, dirhams or rupees, not expensive in India or the UAE. Uh, we, we charge a price that we think is fair uh, for the South African market, and we have just extended this um, opportunity to our international candidates um, because we feel that we want to spread the gospel of cricket. Um, so it's not to undervalue this qualification. Um, I think South Africa is still, in terms of cricketing knowledge and infrastructure, one of the best countries in the world. And um, you can see by the performances of our national team and the performances of Marie Rasmus that uh, we've got a pretty decent setup in terms of umpiring in the country. Um, so yes, you are welcome to go and attend Simon Toffel's course for a thousand US dollars. Um, but I think you'll be fine here um, with Cricket South Africa's level two. Um, yeah, I hope, I hope that answers your question, Chip. <laughs> Tom, I, I really like to uh, laugh loud. Like, I, I'm happy with whatever uh, happens I'm getting now. I'm really fortunate. I think most of I, I think all of us should be fortunate because you are it's also a great experience because you learn a lot during uh, in more uh, lower matches than high matches because they are more professional and their learning opportunities are there uh, but it's a little mean I, I feel i i think uh but i think i am happy with whatever i'm i'm getting now and maybe when when i become a little bit rich i will go for simon tuffle as well I can guarantee you, you will get 100% for Samuel Toffel's exam after you've been to our lectures, Shiv. So, uh, <laughs> stay, Thanks, stay with us and we'll make you famous. <laughs> yeah. All right, ladies and gents, uh, we've gone to three hours today, almost three hours. Uh, again, a very lovely interactive session from all of you. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you for your commitment to this course. And thank you for helping us all learn together, uh, not just um, to pass the level two exam, but also to improve our umpiring on the field and knowledge of the field. We will meet up again on Wednesday. I will send the recording of this lecture um, probably only tomorrow morning. Uh, sorry, we'll meet up again on Monday. Um, and Abdullah, your microphone is on. Uh, you can wish us good night and um, any well wishes for the weekend. Yeah, good night, everyone. Looking forward to seeing you on Monday um, at half past six at African time. Uh, bye, everyone. Thank you and good night, folks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and salam alaikum and happy Eid to all of those celebrating. Abdullah, when is it coming up? Uh, uh, in South Africa, it looks like it's going to be July the 10th. Okay, so we still got a way to go. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thanks, guys. Have a good evening. Goodbye. Okay. Bye, everyone.